After my last book came out, I stopped writing. I'd taken on something huge, something unsayable, and I'd said it. I'd written about my mother's suicide, albeit through the lens of fiction, but everybody knew. That was my family on the page, my parents' painful relationship, my mother's mental illness. The reaction was off the spectrum. It was like I'd unleashed something, a torrent that was engulfing everything in its path. And there I was, terrified, exposed, unsure I'd ever write again, and telling no one, not my friends, not my partner, Francois, not my kids, who'd just left for uni. I was lost. And then, at a party I wasn't even meant to go to, I met Elle. You dance wonderfully. Oh, thanks. No, let me rephrase that. You dance as if you were on your own and you couldn't care less who was watching. Uh, that bad? It's delightful. Elle, by the way. Delphine. Yes, I, I know who you are. Don't look so scared. I'm a huge fan. That's kind. Inevitable, I'd call it, when the work's as good as yours. Oh. Did I say something wrong? Sorry, it's just been one of those days. Oh, I love this. Come on. We danced for an hour or so, Elle with her eyes shut opposite me. It wasn't a seduction, but it was soothing. Jasmine scent, long blonde hair, styled impeccably. Elle had that kind of casual chic I could never manage. Men were staring. I wondered if she knew. So, uh, this day of yours, let me guess. Deadline stress? Inane questions from a jumped-up journalist? Book signing. Ah. Oh. And the queue was around the block. As it should be, for a book like yours. I'm not sure I deserve that. Not after... After? I walked out. Ah. Oh. Not at first. I signed for four, five hours. And then I was shattered, so I stopped. Quite right. But as I was leaving, a woman gripping my book came up, so eager for me to sign it. And I left. I just left. Good for you. Good for me. I'm sure you felt like you'd been stripped naked and caught in someone else's headlights. Or, or am I putting words in your mouth? Uh, no, that's exactly how I put it. There, you see. To my editor, afterwards. But I mean, exactly. <laughs> word for word. You know what we need? <laughs> Oof, where are we going? <laughs> now, where are you? <sighs> There's nothing left. Ha! A ghost always sniffs out the vodka. A ghost? Writer. Ghost. I'm a ghost writer. Sante. <laughs> Sante. So, would I know your work? Possibly. But you won't find me at any signings. Oh, lucky you. I'm not surprised you're reeling, Delphine. After a book like yours. So bold, so unflinching. Mm. Of course you're drained. All writing's hard. Yours, mine? Mine? Compared to yours, mine's just reportage. Have you always done it? Mm, no. Only since my husband died. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it was some time ago. Another? Sure. <laughs> Let's drink to your success. Oh. Can't we? Success is an accident. An accident? It's messy and random and... Comes along with damage. Yes, it does. I don't know how Elle did that. Pick up so instantly on what was needling me the most. The disarray my book's success had put me in. It was comforting and unnerving. I was still able to hold a pen, jot things down at that stage. And I had days, a stay at Francois's place in the country not long after the party, where I almost relaxed. I told Francois I'd started a new book. I hadn't. <laughs> I had a hazy outline. Nothing on paper. But I got home refreshed. Hopeful. And then, in my post, a typewritten note. So you think you got away with it? You changed a few names, called your book a novel, and thought everyone was fooled. As if. You've sown hatred, Delphine. You'll regret it. You've betrayed your mother's memory. Sold out on her for a nice, fat cheque. Very smart. 
Nothing like a juicy family saga to rake it in. Just make sure my share's in the post. Hello. Delphine, it's Elle. From the party? Her oh. perfume and the shots we'd shared oh, came back to me. Oh, I, I that night had ended time. in a blur. No, I didn't think we'd all. exchanged I numbers. I you to a coffee, can I? I'm in your area, just finishing up an interview. She must have got my number from a friend, and that was flattering. Or oh, maybe I'd have said yes to anyone just then. So, who are you writing for? An actor. She was in the last Depardieu film. Mm. Much more to do, or...? No, that was it. Final meeting. But you'll see her again. Oh, no. No, it gets tricky. No, after the book's done, I cut the cord and... And that's that? Yes. Once it's over, once I've announced end of file to my dictaphone... Uh, you say it. Out loud. Just my little tick. Well, after six months of living with them, travelling with them... Oh. You take the fly-on-the-wall approach. Exactly. I'm the fly. <sighs> You must go a bit mad. More mm, they do. Really? But it pays off. What is it Deleuze says? If you don't grasp the germ of madness in someone, you miss out on their charm? Hmm. I like that. Where's my notebook? You don't... You're left-handed. Like me. Uh, are you? Left-handed people always find each other. We're like a secret society. A left-handed society? Exactly. <laughs> You're a card-carrying member. Do I get an expense account? No, but you do get another coffee. I liked Elle's directness, her odd tangents, Later. and she distracted me from my fear of the screen. We started to meet more. Lunch here, coffee there. Elle was always attentive, available. I don't think I saw her check her phone once in the whole time I knew her. Unlike me. Up. Oh. Sorry. It's Francois. It's fine. Now, I, I told him I'd go over to his later. Oh. You don't live together? No. We kept separate places. It's easier. He travels a lot. The documentary in Boston. You said next. Well, well done. <laughs> Sometimes I think you're taking notes. Oh, I'm well and truly off duty. Really? The book's done? No, but I, I like to take a break between drafts. Mm. Is there anyone you wouldn't write about? Ivan Lendl. What? <laughs> Why? He was my teenage crush. So awkward. That's impossible. I know. <laughs> Odd choice, right? I don't think he smiled once in his whole career until... Roland Garros, 1984, Lendl versus McEnroe. I'm impressed. He was my crush, too. You're joking. Not that anyone knew. Well, clearly we both have very strange taste in men. Don't say that, Francois. Oh! What? <laughs> Just behind you, a little mouse. Where? No, it's, it's fine. It's, it's gone. Are you OK? No. Where are you going? Sorry. The mouse genuinely scared Elle. I saw her fragile side, only for a second, but it was there. Most of the time she was in control, or like an Amazon if she wanted to be. Once on the metro, we were stuck next to a couple arguing. The guy was haranguing his girlfriend. It was you know those awful. Are my work colleagues, don't you? Professional people. They expect a bit of he kept on at her. The whole carriage was cringing, but the girlfriend just took it. P dropout. I mean, God, you're embarrassing. So L went up to the guy, stood right in front of him, close enough to kiss him. What's your problem? You got your period or something? <laughs> <laughs> Pushed him off. Right off onto the platform. Well, that's rather magnificent. Isn't it? And slightly scary. Oh, no, she's nice. You'll like her. Right. Well, I think we require some burgundy. <laughs> oh, no. What? She's cancelled. She's got a migraine. Oh, shame. I'll call her tomorrow. Look, leave yourself some room as well, Dee. You know how attached you get to your friends. But Francois was wrong. Most of my friends had left or were leaving the city by then. Elle's appearance in my life was perfectly timed. Do you cook? I did more when the kids were around. They've settled in to their courses. They love it. It's funny, when I look back now, five years... Yes? Everything was different. 
My kids were here, my friends were nearby. What happened? Life, jobs, family. It was like one day Paris caught the plague and everyone couldn't get away fast enough. It was like that for me too, after Jean died. Was it sudden? Uh, I'll tell you about it sometime. So, what are you working on? That was out of the blue. We hadn't talked about my work, and I hadn't wanted to. But I did want to change the subject for Elle's sake. So I told her about my hazy idea. A book about a reality TV star, a woman who's shot to fame suddenly. And she can't handle the version of herself that's gone viral. And then I'm also interested in the young man who edits the show and who constructs her persona from the footage. It's about fragmentation, identity. <laughs> Is any of this making sense? So, it's fiction. Fiction? Right. It's just, don't take this the wrong way. Yes. Fiction's dead, isn't it? You showed that with your last book. Did I? You gave the reader truth, your truth. You took on old wounds, you dug into them, you were fearless. And I'm still not over it. Well, that's no reason to give up. I don't intend to. Didn't you say? That's it. In an interview, I remember, you said your last book had a hidden book in it. One that would go even deeper, further than the last. I did say that, yes. So? Maybe I will. Maybe. Maybe. It's the only way, surely. Everything else is just a trick. I don't plan on writing anything that reads like a trick. And I think my idea does chime with something real. Modern paranoia about image, authenticity. Unreliable narrators, the death of the author. Yes, we've all been there, Delphine. We've all made our A4 notes on Bart and, and Duran and Bovary. Well, that's me told. Sorry, God. Sorry. Elle's anger came out of nowhere. I heard her running the taps in the bathroom before she came back. More wine. Thanks. So you did a literature degree? Yes. Only because those were my first year texts you mentioned, so... Mine too. Which uni? Here. Class of 89. So, wait, we were in the same year. Why didn't you say? Well, nobody likes being the girl everyone forgot. <sighs> About before. It's fine. No, no, it was unpardonable. I was... It's honestly... Harsh. I was too harsh. After all, your idea. Yes? If it's what you want to write. I'm sure you know best. I stayed up that night, rerunning the evening. Not just Elle's outburst, but her strange admission we'd been students together. I trawled my mind for memories of her. Eventually, in the small hours, I got up got out my old albums and fished out my first-year photo. Gradually, one by one, the faces came back to me. And then it hit me. None of them was Elle. She wasn't there. Each of us, if we're honest, knows what it is that makes our friends just that, friends. With Elle, it was simple, we clicked. She understood, or seemed to, exactly where I was at. She knew, without me saying, how much energy it had taken to fictionalize my mother's suicide and confront the aftermath. As a ghostwriter, her work was all-consuming too, so we had that in common. In any case, it was impossible not to be drawn to her. She was charismatic, poised, but sometimes, like a lost child, without warning. And this was the first year photo? First year literature, yes. I double checked, but you're not in it. Oh, I know. I, I think I had flu that day. Typical. Why typical? Well, I'd, I'd have liked there to be a record of us as students. You can't remember me, so... I, I didn't say that. You didn't have to. <laughs> there are two types of people in the world, Delphine. The ones who make an impact, who we never forget, and the ones we edit out. You're the first. I'm the last. It was so untrue. I thought about giving her a hug, 
or blurting out, OK, I made an impact, but do you know what? I think it cost me my career. I can't go near my desk without retching. I'm on sleeping pills. And I'm lying to my partner because I'm afraid if Francois knew I can't write, he'd run a mile. Or blame himself, which would be worse. He's off in the States making a documentary and I'm here desperately trying to keep a lid on it. But I didn't say that, not then. And then I got the letter, the second letter. Hello? It's me. I've got us Madeleines. Great. What's the matter? Nothing. There is, I can tell. Come up. Elle took the note straight out of my hand, read it at the kitchen table. Delphine, do you know what it's like having your surname? It makes me want to throw up because you've taken our name and you've made it filthy. Never forget you're sick. It's in your genes. You can't escape it. I've heard you've got rid of your kids. Pack them off to uni so you can play the cougar. Hmm. You're a terrible mother and a media whore. I feel sorry for your kids. You got this today? This one, yes. This one? There was another. Sorry. Oh, come, come here. <laughs> come on. Sit. Sit. <laughs> So, what does Francois think about this? I haven't told him. He'd get upset. You're upset. Look, why don't I make us some lunch? We'll eat, talk it through. Elle knew her way around my kitchen. Made soup, salad, something with courgette. It was delicious. I'm sorry. What for? Oh, overreacting. You didn't. I get all kinds of letters. I let them wash over me. Usually. And so should this. Even better. Use it. How? Print it. And the other one in your next book. I can't. Show him or her you don't care. I can't do that. Look, Delphine, you're not responsible for this outburst, this poison pen freak, this family member, whoever they are. They hated you before your book came out. He just wanted the chance to vent, and you gave it to him. Frankly, he should be grateful. I don't think he sees it like that somehow. But he should. You fulfilled one of the key duties a writer has, to provide a catharsis. You've taken on real pain and gone there, and you can do it again. I'm not sure. Of course you can. What you wrote was radioactive. The fallout isn't going away any time soon. I know that. So use it. Use what it's really like going public with a book like yours. The letters, the stares, the, the false friends, the ones who claim you've had Botox or, or an eyelid lift. Isn't that what you've told me it's like? It was funny. We had a laugh. But this note isn't funny. It's toxic. You can't let him get away with it. Maybe I don't have a choice. Why wouldn't you? I can't. Can't what? I can't write. Come on. You're just in a fallow period. It's not that. You've got the reality TV idea. It's going nowhere. Well, I'm not an expert, Delphine, but maybe your subconscious knows you've been heading down a blind alley. Really? Maybe it wants you to write what's true to you. Your hidden book. I can't. Write anything. Elle, I'm telling you, not a shopping list, not emails. Look. Elle became ultra calm when she saw the chaos my inbox was in, offered to move in and sort some of my admin on the spot. And it made sense. She set herself up in my son's old room that night. The flat filled with her perfume and every morning we sat together, Elle with my laptop in front of her, me on a cushion on the floor. So, you've had a chasing email about the Maupassant introduction. Oh, that's so overdue. Well, why don't we just, just talk it through? I'll write it up and we'll send it over once we're happy with it. You do that? Of course. And I've dealt with the Berlin woman about next year's trip and that journalist from Publishers Weekly. The pushy one? Oh, thank you. And then there's the school visit to Arras. Oh, God, that. Well, well, it's not till next month, so let's not worry. We'll think of something. I'm not quite sure when I became we, but the Delphine I used to be was on hold. Elle was the new me. <laughs> she even started wearing my brand of jeans. We were in sync. 
My affairs were getting back on track and I started to think maybe I could too. I still couldn't use my laptop, but I had my notebooks and was managing to jot some thoughts down. Then, after a journey on a crowded tube train with Elle... Oh, no, 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 no. What? Someone slipped my bag. You're joking. Oh, please, 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 don't have fallen out. What? Shit! Your wallet. Oh. Oh, and my notebooks. Oh, was there much there? Everything I've done to rework the reality TV idea. Elle was kind. She gave me the number oh. to cancel my credit cards and the next morning handed me a gift. Notebooks. I went out early for them. Now you can start again. I think I've lost too much. Start something fresh. Carl Elf. You think it's as simple as that? It was harsh, but my head was spinning. I needed air. I walked around the block five times, rang my editor, told her the reality TV idea was off. Came home, slumped. Later, Elle slipped something under my door. The Maupassant introduction. It was flawless. Yes? I, I just wanted to thank you for this. It's brilliant. Pleasure. Did you do something to your hair? Just used your straightness. Looks lovely. Like me on a good day. Which isn't today. Oh, that's understandable. I didn't need to snap your head off, though. You're just tense. I'm sure you could do without that school visit next week. Oh, God, don't remind me. I've been thinking. Yes? I know this sounds odd, but why don't I go? To the school? Instead of me? No, not, not instead of you, as you. I'm not sure. I... Well, you said yourself we look similar. No one there's met you before, and frankly, your photos online look like at least five different people. It'll never work. It's a whole day. There'll be questions. Well, try me. Ask me something. Oh, fine. OK. Um, miss, what's it like writing a smash-hit bestseller? Well, the thing is, success is an accident. That's... How did you... I told you. I'm good. And she was. Elle had my voice, my walk, my gestures to a T. It was weird seeing her, the morning she set off, in my clothes. More me than me. I was glad, but I also felt maybe, if I looked at myself in the mirror, I might not see anything there at all. I think that's why, when the journalist from Publishers Weekly rang, on the off chance I'd changed my mind, I said yes. It was one way to prove I was still there. And having such a huge hit with your last book, how's that been? Overwhelming, I won't lie. Is it hard to come back from? Well, I'm taking a break, so... <laughs> Clever. <laughs> I knew you'd not want to talk about it, but maybe you can give us a tiny hint about the new big project? There isn't one. OK, so this is where I admit we have a mutual friend. Natalie Lee? She let me see the email you sent all your friends asking to be left alone and until the new book's done. But what email? Uh, OK, hang on. I think she forwarded it to me. It's, it's in my phone somewhere. Oh, here. I read the email quickly. It was as he said, to 20 or so of my closest friends, politely but firmly asking them not to get in touch for at least three months. I needed space and time for my new book to breathe. It was dated the 27th, two days after Elle had taken over my inbox. I'm back! Ah, uh, I'm sorry, but can we reschedule? Uh, sure. Now's not a great time. Sorry. I'll call you. Elle was in the bathroom. I hurried the journalist out before they could meet. When I came back into the kitchen, she was waiting. Who is that? No one. They drink an awful lot of coffee for no one. How was it? How did it go? Like a dream. The librarian was a bit iffy at first. Oh, no. Oh, it was nothing. Nothing. A few sidelong looks. Did she say anything? How could she? The students were eating out of my hand. Oh, that's great. So, who is this mysterious coffee drinker? The journalist from Publishers Weekly. I thought we told him no. We did. 
But I said yes when he rang back. I didn't see any harm. Delphine, we've been through all this. Hacks like that, they're, they're parasites. Actually, he told me something interesting. Oh? He told me, well, showed me an email you'd written to my friends under my name warning them off, saying I had some big new book to write and they should stay away until it was done. And? And? Is that all you can say? I was trying to help. Told my friends to back off. Not like that. They're my friends. I'm your friend. The only friend I'd say who knows, who, who truly knows what you're capable That's of. That's not the point. But it is. Everyone else, that, that hack included, will peddle you some, some random agenda of their own. Only I can help you focus on your hidden book. For God's sake, El, there is no hidden book. But there can be. That's for me to decide. That's just it. You can't. You've made this cocoon and you, you're stuck in it. What are you talking about? Your cosy life, the, the friends, the partner on tap, it's numbing you. Is that what you think? I think the reader wants to know about the dark spaces in your life, Delphine. The, the cold, hard truth. It's, it's called hard for a reason, but don't be scared of it. We can go there, together. Now, I have never written to please someone else in my life. I just, I don't do it. That's not how I work. From what I can see, Delphine, these days you don't really work at all. I walked out. I hate conflict. Any conflict, and that was like a punch in the face. I walked for hours to get away from Elle, the Elle I'd never seen before. Her flashing eyes. It was late when I got back and the flat was silent. I was sure she'd gone to bed. But when I walked into the kitchen, there was a note saying she'd moved out. She felt it was for the best and would have the rest of her stuff picked up the next day. The note was mild, apologetic. Elle said she totally regretted sending the email. She'd overstepped the mark. She could see that now. She said she'd always be there for me. She said a lot of things. I can't remember them all, but one phrase sticks with me. At the very end, she wrote, I'm worried about you, Delphine. I'm worried something dreadful's going to happen. Hi, Delphine, it's Karina. Great news, oh. the book's just topped the charts in Germany now, and Macedonia, of all places. Message deleted. Next new message. Hi, this is Claire from Gallimard. Thanks for the Mopas on piece, it's wonderful. Just confirming the launch date. Message deleted. After Elle left, I sank. Slept badly. Didn't take calls. Didn't even try to write. I had a third anonymous note. Worse than the last. It said, Francois must have sexual problems to be with me. I cried reading it. I didn't tell him. Francois was still mostly in Boston anyway, finishing his documentary. He had one short break in his schedule. We took it at his place in the country, but I didn't bring it up. Things went OK until the car ride on the way to catch his flight. Do you want to talk about it? What? Whatever it is that's bothering you. I'm fine. <laughs> You've barely said a word all weekend. Sometimes I find the countryside stifling. Oh, come on. I do. I told you when we first met. Is it the new book that's bothering you? No. Would you make much headway? Some, but I, I can't talk about it. Of course you can't. Don't be like that. You don't have to put up a wall, Dee. I'm not the enemy. Is that how you feel? Of course not. I'm just... I'm just worried about you. You're in a trance half the time these days. It's like you've been spirited away, and I don't know how to bring you back. He was right. I was in a trance. Elle had moved out of my flat, but not my mind. Yes, she'd crossed a line. Yes, the fact she'd emailed my friends as me, asking them to stay away so I could write, was jaw-dropping, appalling. But then again, she knew I was in an extreme place. She was a writer. She knew that writer's block wasn't just some trip switch. You could flick and bam, you'd be fixed. And yes, her insistence I should only write autobiography was way too much. But even when she scared me most, 
Part of me was in awe of her, her complete conviction that she could help. I thought about all the times she'd teased and cajoled me to get me writing again. What does it feel like when you think about writing? I try not to. I'm serious, Delphine. This could help. Oh, OK. It feels like the time I was in London for a book launch, my English editor was incredibly suave, and as we pulled up at the hotel, he got out, went to open the car door for me, and I knew. A voice said to me very clearly, you're going to fall on your face. And did you? Yes. In the gutter. And what did he do? Uh, he didn't bat an eyelid. He helped me up and we went. There. You see? So, there's nothing to fear. He must have thought I was a freak. No, I'm, I'm sure he thought you were a charming, idiosyncratic writer. <laughs> That's one word for it. Just as talented. More, in fact, than any of this lot lining your shelves. Have you really read all these, Delphine? I have. So, you've read... Dog's Night Only Loved the Renunciation, the Echo Chamber Gone Girl, the Summer He Didn't Die, Elizabeth... It was one of Elle's rituals. The bookcase ritual. I think it was how she let off steam after hours spent writing up her audio files. Anyway, in the silence after she left, I missed it. And her. Hi, Delphine. It's Claire from Gallimard again. I... Uh, hello. Oh, wonderful. Glad I caught you. Just running through the format of the launch and... Uh, right, yes. We'd love it if you could read an extract. Maybe take a few questions on Maupassant. How does that sound? Horrendous. Like torture. Even as I said yes, I thought, I need to call Elle. She could go in my place. But in the month since she'd moved out, I'd tried her mobile already and got nowhere. In any case, there'd be people there who'd know me. I had to go. The reading was packed. I kept my head down. My mouth was dry, but I got to the end, looked up, and there was Elle, in the third row, wearing exactly the same clothes as me. She gave me a little smile. It completely threw me, and I thought, oh, God, what will people think that I brought my double along? And then, next confused thought, well, since she's here and she looks like me, maybe I could get her up on stage, spare me the agony of the Q&A. Then I got a grip and stumbled through, conscious all the time of Elle willing me on. I wanted to see her. I kept her in my eyeline, signing books afterwards, but then I got pulled into some small talk, and when I looked around, she'd gone. I dashed out of there, panicking, really, desperate to catch her. I got to the top of the steps just outside the building and saw her, a way off, vanishing into the crowd. Wait, Elle, I rushed down wait the stairs, two at a time, but I stumbled. My legs just went, and I fell. Badly. Somebody called an ambulance. They were bundling me in, about to slam the doors, when I saw her, Elle on the other side of the road, calling to me. Delphina, don't worry, I'm going to meet you at the hospital. There you are. Elle! Oh, you poor thing. How did you get through? I told them you were severely depressed and it'd be better if someone was with you. Uh, is that a joke? Anyway, how are you? It's my left foot, I think, but I'm OK. Bruised? Mainly my dignity. They're going to x-ray it. Your dignity? My foot. <laughs> it was so good to see her. To have her there by my side when I most needed it. She sat with me for two, three hours, waiting for the x-ray. And then she finally opened up to me. I never thought she would, but she did. I spent time in hospital after my husband died. I'm sorry. Oh, a psychiatric clinic. You don't have to tell me if you... No, it's fine. I don't mind. How old were you? Twenty-five. It was the day after Jean's funeral. I came downstairs and tried to... speak. But I couldn't. At all? No. Not a murmur. <sighs> Could they treat it? They wanted me to try drugs. I refused to swallow most of them. So you were in a clinic for... Six months. You must have been terrified. It was. Lonely. Yes. 
I remember thinking, is this it? Is this really how I'm going to spend my life? What did you do? Mm, it took time, but you have time in a place like that. I practiced speaking under the covers. <laughs> Eventually I made sounds, words. One day, the nurse came in with the breakfast and I wanted so badly to say something back. And did you? I recited something. What? I've dreamed of you so long. Hugged your shadow tight. Would my arms even know how to hold you if you were really here? The way she told it, it was obvious how much Elle had gone through, how much she'd suffered, and that was when I knew. For the first time in forever, I knew I could write again. If it was Elle's story, it had to be. This damaged, fascinating woman, my friend, with her quirks and her complexities, I had to write that. Elle had been so obsessed with the idea that real life had to be the basis of my next book, my hidden book, and she was right. Except it had to be her life, not mine, and she could never find out. You fell? I don't understand. I tripped. What do you need me to it find It was Elle's idea to call Francois and ask if we could borrow his country place. They'd put a splint on my left leg up to the knee, I'd be on crutches for a month. I had the keys so we could set off that night. It was perfect. The perfect chance to tease out more of Elle's story and maybe even plan out how I could tell it. We sat in traffic getting out of Paris for about an hour. Then out of the blue. It was like this when Jean and I met. You met your husband in a traffic jam. I gave him a lift. <laughs> Was he hitchhiking or...? Yes, and I don't normally stop for them. So, why Jean? Oh, I don't know. I broke the habit of a lifetime. Was he good-looking? Well, I liked him, but he seemed tired when he got in and, and a bit older than I thought at first. <laughs> and? He looked at me. We didn't talk. I knew I wanted him. Just like that? Mm. I breathed in his smell. Tobacco mixed with leather. That was it. We drove to a hotel. Made love. I knew we'd stay together. How? Nothing else before him felt real. Were you happy? At first. But Jean had depression. I don't think I realised how badly until we took a trip to the mountains. Was he working? Or... Oh, he'd stopped by then. He'd been a dentist, but wanted a change. He had all sorts of plans, but nothing ever got off the ground, so he mainly did bar work. Somehow I thought the trip would help. So you went to...? The Alps. He didn't want to at first, but then he changed his mind. We packed our stuff, sleeping bags, camping stove. Jean brought a shotgun in case there were bears. He borrowed it from someone in the bar. And it was so beautiful when we got there. Silence. The isolation. Just us and our cabin. The nearest village was a day away. But we had plenty of provisions. I thought we should stay as long as they lasted. It was like a challenge. Except after a week, John wanted to go back. Why? He said he missed the city. He needed noise, traffic, people. I said... Yes. I said, if he really loved me, he'd stay. Is that terrible? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I think it is. Anyway, then there was a storm, a horrendous storm, so we couldn't leave. It lasted four days. Four? We were completely cut off. We just huddled inside, <sighs> fighting the cold. It was so cold. I remember when it passed, I was so glad to go outside. I was heading towards the forest for a walk when I heard the gun go off. God. It was so brief. The echo. I thought I'd dreamt it, but when I got back to the cabin, I found him. I remember looking down, thinking, 
This is John. I'm walking in Jean's blood. Oh, I had no idea. It was a long time ago. We drove through the darkness in silence. I kept replaying what Elle had told me, the horror of it. I felt terrible for her. But also, so many things about her slotted into place. The fact her friends had drifted off when Jean died, her flare-ups, her fragility. And I realized why she was so drawn to my work, its exploration of suicide. She must have felt we were kin. I wanted so much in that instant to please her, to make her proud of me, as if our friendship had made a difference. So I told her. I voluntarily told her I felt I could write again. She was ecstatic. She almost cried. And then she asked me, was this my hidden book? My follow-up that would delve even deeper into my damaged past. And I didn't pause for a second. I just lied, and I said yes. Elle's husband, Jean, picked him up hitchhiking. Depressive, shot himself on a holiday in the Alps. Waking up that first morning at Francois's place in the country without him there was strange. My foot in its cast ached, and the sky outside looked like sludge, but that wasn't it. It was what Elle had shared in the car journey from Paris the night before. The details of her traumatic past. It was the oddest thing. Hearing it had been shocking, but not a surprise. And to me, I admit, it felt like a gift. For the first time in weeks, adrenaline was kicking in. I had a project, a stealthy one, but I knew if I could tease out from Elle more of her unsettling story, I'd write again. I still couldn't hold a pen or type, but I could talk into the dictaphone on my mobile. After Jean's suicide, diagnosed as mute. Oh. I'm back with croissant. I'll be right there. Of course, it was risky. I told Elle a barefaced lie that I was writing autobiography. But hadn't Elle said herself, great writing came from great pain. Though she'd meant mine, not hers. There you are. How's it going? I'm just doing some voice memos. Your Francois did not leave the place well stocked, I'm afraid. Not to worry. I've got us all sorts. Just one more bag in the hall. Oh, I'll get it. No, Delphine, no, stop. I can manage. Seriously. Or do I have to put your other foot in a cast as well? Elle was in her element, organising the kitchen, the cooking, me. With me writing again, she thought she'd won the battle. You should be careful out there. If you fell again... No, it's just my signal's so patchy inside. How is he, anyway? Francois? Oh, fine. Busy. As ever. Here, have some soup. Thanks. Did you feed the fish? Sorry? In the pond. I had another look at them. I'm sure they're carnivorous. Mm, really? If we don't feed them, they'll eat each other. Maybe we should give them some of your soup. It's delicious. Mm. It is, isn't it? I'd never seen Elle so serene. Maybe because she thought I was so caught up with my own story, she relaxed and told me some of hers. I was seven, almost eight, when my mother took her life. God. I found her lying in the corridor, wearing her yellow summer dress. Oh, Elle. I thought she must be asleep. So I crawled on top of her, dozed. You've had to be so brave. You're braver. I don't think that's true. You are. Most people hide their scars. You unpick yours and write about them. I was going to explain. I was going to tell her why I felt I had to base my new protagonist on her. But not yet. Not before I had more material. 
The days fell into a pattern. Long dinners, long talks, and in the morning, work. I was managing now to jot down stray words on post-its, triggers that would help me find the right question next time I got Elle to open up. For safety, I stuck them inside a notebook and kept it closed. Elle had a new memoir on the go. She'd signed a confidentiality clause, so couldn't talk about it, but it kept her occupied. Her room was a corridor away. I kept the door wedged shut and an ear out for footsteps. Kept her off school. The noise confused me. I barely had time to work out Elle was heading my way before she came into my room. We've got mice. Oh, at least two. I wasn't sure, but, but now I am. Shush, come here. Here, have my, have my seat. Oh, yeah. oh. They were um, rustling about in the cellar. Oh, God, what if they get up here? Shush, it's OK. They I won't. calmed her down, gave her the I'll chance to flop in my chair and get her breath says. back. Yeah. Just as she was about to leave, she looked up and saw a post-it. One I hadn't tucked away. It said, find out more about Jean's suicide. She stiffened. And disbelief and something darker flickered in her eyes. She didn't say a word. Just got up, thanked me and left, the house went quiet after that. Elle took the car and went out. I hunched by the fire. I was worried, of course. But when Elle finally got back, her mood was not what I expected. I'm so sorry. It took ages. The man in the shop had so many different kinds of mousetrap and a lot of information on rat poison, I can tell you, which was music to my ears, to be honest. I almost kissed the guy. Did you? No, but I did buy us one of each. So, wow. I know. But more importantly, since it's so miserable out there, I thought we needed a treat for dinner, so... Ta-da! Lobster! Two. Yes. <sighs> and I'm going to do my special hollandaise, which you will She was radiant. There was no edge, nothing in her manner to suggest she felt betrayed. She joked. She cooked the lobsters, calmly pushing them down into the pan with a smile. And by the time we'd drunk our way to the end of the meal, she was confiding in me again. Honestly... I don't know how I survived my childhood. That bad? My father was a bully. Sometimes I thought I'd never get out alive. How did you cope? I had an imaginary friend, Ziggy. We did everything together. Huh. Did your dad know? Oh, of course not. No, he'd have blown his top. But no, Ziggy got me through. I talked to her, told her how much I dreamed of running away. <laughs> I remember once she said to me, just wait, in a few days we'll do it. It'll all work out. What happened? There was a fire. The house we'd lived in with my mother burnt down. That's right, just around then. Just after Ziggy said she'd rescue me. Elle's memories never came in any order. I always tried to capture them as soon as I could to puzzle out where they might fit. That night, I recorded some stuff about Ziggy, saved the file and passed out cold. I was so tired. I woke up in the small hours, drenched in sweat, my hair sticking to my face. I was shivering and I knew I was going to be sick, but I couldn't move. Uh, I only got to the corridor. You poor thing. <gasps> Delphine. <gasps> oh, come on. Come on now. Let's go this way. Elle cleaned me up. Ran a bath for me, I think. I kept passing out, but I remember her covering my foot in its cast with a towel so it wouldn't get wet. She stayed there a long while. Then I think she went to change my sheets. Mm. At least when I came to, they were fresh. Oh, what time is it? Don't worry about that. Here. <sighs> Oh. oh, sorry. Oh, no. Shh. It's okay. We'll get your fever down here. Take these. 
Good girl. Oh. Is it Francois? Don't worry about anything. I'll deal with it. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? This is Dolphine's phone. After that, I lost track of time. I don't know how long I spent drifting in and out of sleep. Two days, four, six. Every time I awoke, Elle was there. I need to talk to Francois. I have already. I need to tell him. I told him. He knows you have food poisoning, and I'll give him updates. Now, come on. We need to get your strength up. I would gag most of the time on the tea or broth or whatever Elle brought me. She'd hold my head like a baby because that was how weak I was and try to feed me. One night, I woke up dizzy, thinking I must call my kids. They'll be worried. I put my hand out for my phone, searched. It wasn't there, which meant Elle had it. Elle had my phone, and on my phone were the files I'd recorded about Elle. She must have heard them, so she knew. She absolutely knew what I'd been doing. I don't know if it was night or day, but someone came round. A neighbour, a friend of Francois. I don't know who, but they must have got past the front gate and come to check on us. I heard Elle go to the door and stand by it. She didn't let them in. I should have called out, but I had no strength. Eventually, they left. Later, maybe a day, Elle made fish soup. I barely ate more than a mouthful. I was so nauseous. But when I woke up, I remember my head felt clearer, like some of the weight pressing down on it had lifted. Here we are. Room service. Oh, I, I can't. Elle, my stomach. This will help your stomach. P please. Elle. Delphine, you need to make an effort. She picked up the spoon, <gasps> leant in, but I flinched. Honestly, Delphine. Sorry. These are fresh sheets. I didn't care about the sheets or the spilled milk because I'd seen Elle using her right hand. I've everything for you. You know that? Everything. Elle, who'd claimed she was left-handed like me, who said we were in sync so close. She lied. She wasn't my friend. I didn't know who she was, but she wasn't that. I've tried so hard, but you have to ruin everything, don't you? I promise, Elle. I'll drink it later. I promise. Fine. Just make sure you do. When she'd gone, I got up, stumbled to the window, poured the whole drink out. She was poisoning me. It was clear. I had to get out. There was a storm forecast, and my crutches and other clothes were nowhere to be seen, but I had to get out that night. I pictured myself getting past the front gate into the road, arms up, headlights swooping over me, a car door opening and me being saved. Then I passed out. Another dull, heavy sleep. When I woke up, I had no sense of what time it was. Or where Elle was. I could hear the rain lashing the trees and cars on the road. I thought it was cars. I hoped it was cars. All I knew was my mouth tasted of metal and I had to get out. I couldn't wait any longer. I swung myself up, steeled myself and just went, dragging my foot in its cast. It was agony, but I made it to the kitchen. I couldn't hear L anywhere. Grabbed the key to the front gate and I was out. In the rain and the storm, walking into the wind, trying to run, but the pain in my foot was like a knife. I got to the gate, looked back, and Elle's car was missing. Where was she? I had no idea. And no time to think. I opened the gate, kept my head down, limped towards the village. If Elle was in her car somewhere, waiting in a lay-by, ready to pull out and run me down, there was nothing I could do. I had to keep on. I had to get to the village. <gasps> then I slipped. There was a ditch. I was metres from the village and I slipped and went over like a nine pin into the mud. And I blacked out. I 
I don't remember much about the ambulance. A workman found me passed out in the ditch around dawn. The doctor said any longer and I wouldn't have made it. No one asked why I'd been out there, half-dressed in the small hours with a fractured foot and no crutches. They let me sleep, gave me pills for the pain and sedatives, I think. And when I woke up, Francois was there. Hey. Are you back? Of course. Oh. I caught the first flight. Come here. Oh. Oh, don't be silly. Shh. Everything all right? Well, she's... she's overawed. Delphine, I'd like you to take these for me, please. <sighs> Can I have a word? Uh, sure. <sighs> We've had the results back from toxicology. And? There were traces of rat poison and sleeping pills in your wife's... My, my partner's? In your partner's blood. Rat poison? We think it's likely to have been a suicide attempt. It was obvious from the way the doctors treated me. They thought I'd had a breakdown. I could have asked then for the police, tried to press charges against Elle. But I was shattered. The only person I wanted to talk to was Francois. Have some water. I need to tell you something. Here. I need you to listen because I made you fly back early for me and... Oh, I wanted to. I was worried. I sent Shah around and he got nowhere and I kept calling you but you didn't pick up. Elle had my phone. What did she tell you? Who? Elle. She answered my phone. Well, I never spoke to her. But she said... Look, Dee, maybe we should just focus on the future now. Please, Francois, I need you to listen. Elle was trying to poison me. What? That's why I ran out into the storm. That's a hell of an accusation. I know, and I know. I said Elle was my friend, but I was an idiot. And I did something stupid. What? Trusted her. You know, at the house, there's no sign of her or her car. Well, no. She's long gone. But the whole place was spotless. The only sign of life was the mess in your room. I left in a hurry. But why on earth would she want to harm you? I made a mistake, okay? I thought I could write about her, and I'd begun to. I'd made some recordings on my phone, and she found out. She was livid. But hang on. You told me you'd started a new book months ago. You were making headway. I didn't want you to worry. Well, so that was a lie. No, but it was a dead end. And then, after I tripped and hurt my foot, Elle started coming out with all this stuff. What stuff? Weird, messy stuff about her past, and I thought it would make a great character. So where are the files? The... The audio you recorded. I told you I don't have my phone. Elle took it. So you have no proof? No, but... Delphine, sometimes oh. I wonder whether I shouldn't be really worried. I mean, I never met this Elle once. It, how do I even know she wasn't a man? But how can you say that? Because it doesn't add up. She was a woman, okay? I met her at a party. She was a friend, a ghostwriter. How come we never cross paths? Hmm? Not at an opening, not at a dinner. I haven't been going to those, Francois. If you'd been here, you'd have noticed. Oh, so this is my fault? No, of course not. Because I wasn't worried before, but now I... Oh, I'm just really tired. I don't want us to fight. Well then, let's not. I did try one more time to convince him. But Francois had decided I'd been depressed, isolated, possibly on the wrong meds, and that was that. He didn't specifically say I'd made Elle up or hallucinated her. But as his only other theory was that I'd been having an affair, I let it drop. And I didn't have proof. Elle had meticulously covered her tracks. When I got back to Paris, I turned my laptop on and... As I expected, she deleted all the emails we'd sent each other. Then I tried her phone, which was dead. Went round to her flat, it had been let. Finally, I got hold of the friend whose party we'd met at. But she had no memory of a tall, stylish woman with long blonde hair. I was really on edge doing this. Hyper alert, I think they call it. A car alarm, a door slam, anything like that and I would panic. That's why I felt I had to find Elle before she found me. 
Hello? Yes, hello. I wonder if you could help. I'm hoping to talk to whoever deals with author visits. That would be me. I'd remembered what Elle had said about her school visit in Arras. The librarian hadn't been convinced that she was me. That was the key, I thought. Find that woman, and I'd have at least one other eyewitness account of Elle. What's it regarding? I just wanted to ask for some feedback on my visit and the impression you had of me. Is this a joke? No. You don't show up. We have a hundred students disappointed and no phone call, no apology. Unless this is some kind of sick apology and when I write to you... I hung up. I didn't know what to say. Elle had lied? She hadn't gone there? Or tried to help me? Or had she? It didn't make sense. So your physio went well? Really well. Oh, darling, that's great. I'm so pleased you're getting back to normal. I let him believe it. I couldn't tell him about the nights I lay there, going over and over every detail, trying to figure out how Elle had just disappeared. And the other nights I spent checking my flat for bugs and hidden cameras, because if Elle could vanish, she was capable of anything. I got the voicemail on a Friday. I listened to it on the way into my flat. Excited about the new manuscript. Bravo! We'll call tomorrow. It was from Karina, my editor. A mistake, obviously. I ignored it, went to bed. But then she called in the morning. Delphine, can I just say, it is phenomenal. I couldn't put it down. It was terrifying and disturbing and, I mean, really layered. I mean, I know you've had a few doubts and felt like you'd lost direction, but you are back. Seriously, this is the best thing you have ever done. Karina. It is. This has got Goncourt shortlist stamped all over it. It's not mine. What? There's been a mistake. I didn't send you a manuscript. Oh, clever. Yes. We market it like that, just in line with all that stuff you've got in there about doubles and... What stuff? And identity theft and who's really the author. Yes. We go with that, and it will jump off the shelves. I sat there, after the phone call. When I got cold and realised I had pins and needles, I stood up to stamp my feet, and that's when it hit me. Elle had done it. This phenomenal book. My best yet. The one that put the rest of my work in the shade. Was hers. I spoke to Karina today. Oh, yes. She called me. To talk about your new, um, your new book. Oh. Which she was raving about, Dee. I can't believe you didn't tell me. What's it about? I don't know. I didn't write it. See, now, I knew you'd say that. Did you? Well, she told me you've gone all method and keep pretending that you're not the author. I'm not. Right. Sure. So who is that? Isn't it obvious? <laughs> not to me. Elle. Oh, Delphine. There's no way I'm letting it be published. What? Why? For one thing, I haven't read it. But even if I had, there's no way I'm letting that woman back into my life. You're serious? She tried to kill me. Oh, we've been through this. Yes, and I know what you think. You've been in a fragile state and nobody else met her, not once. But even if she were real... She was real. Even if she was... How could she write in your voice something so personal? Is it personal? I haven't read it. God, you can be stubborn. Look, I let my guard down, all right? Those letters scared me and Elle seemed to want to help. I let her take over everything, my flat, my laptop, my life. You bet, well, what letters? Just some poison pen letters. So, wait, you've been receiving hate mail and depressed, and alone, all this time. Not alone, with Elle. And you've still managed to come out with a brilliant new book? Francois. <laughs> Don't care what you say, or how you style it. This is amazing. You're amazing. Right. You are, Delphine, and I'm so proud. Say what you like about Elle, but I think... Do you know what I think? What? I think you needed her. So you invented her. She gave you something to write about. It was a nice theory, but that was all it was. The next day, I went to Karina's office and insisted there was no way she could publish whatever it was. I wanted it burned, actually, and she said, in the end, she would. But I know what Karina's like. 
She'll have locked it away somewhere in an archive or a safe, which is fine by me, so long as it stays there. And then life did move on. I started going out more. Francois finished his documentary. One night at my place, we got deep into our current all-time culture picks. It was like old times. We were on books. Oh, so many. Top three right now. Don't overthink it. Just say them. Oh, oh God, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Luna Park, Brett Easton Ellis, Herzog Saul Bellow and The Hours, Michael Cunningham. Uh, you're not American by any chance, are you? Ah, oh, funny. <laughs> what about you? Oh, so hard to say. Page numbers stick with me more than whole books. Ah, uh, of course. I mean, page 113 in David Byrne's debut. Title? Saquon Island. Ah, oh, it's got me for life. Where is it? I opened the book, found the page, oh. and then I froze. Everything I was reading matched Elle's account of her husband, Jean's suicide. The isolated cabin, the snow, the horror of walking in his blood. It was all there. She'd stolen it, word for word. I almost dropped the book. You all right, Dee? Yeah. Did you find it? Yeah. You know what? It's worse than I thought. Let's open another bottle. I went on to autopilot, but in the middle of the night, when he was asleep, I got up and went to the bookcase. In my mind's eye, I saw Elle wheeling around, listing off titles, and suddenly I knew what she'd done. The details of her life, her mother's death, her father, Ziggy, the imaginary friend, all of it was stolen from Salinger, Flynn, Calvino and the rest. Books right there in front of me. My favourite books. No wonder I'd felt that we were like kin. She designed herself to be that. A composite of texts I'd spent my whole life absorbing so she could, what, manipulate me? Make me write the hidden book she was so obsessed I'd come out with? Oh, shivered. I told myself I'd beaten her. I'd survived. But she knew everything about me, and I knew nothing. Not a single fact about her. She had the perfect cover story, which meant she could be anywhere, biding her time, waiting for the moment when she could find me and do... God knows what. That's why I've recorded all this. Otherwise, there's nothing. Nothing to hold on to. Nothing solid that proves to you, to me, that this did happen. I'm not going mad. End of file. In Based on a True Story by Delphine the Vegan, dramatised by Claudine Tatunji, you heard Janie D as Delphine and Tara Fitzgerald as Elle. Philip Bretherton played Francois and Ryan Whittle was the angry man. It was directed by Gemma Jenkins. Well, next week's drama on Woman's Hour over on Radio 4 is one that's leading up to Easter weekend, a powerful story from the multi-award-winning writer Lucy Gannon, Judas. And don't forget, we have the omnibus here on 4 Extra at the same time 